podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 94 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. Um, Hello. Yes, so what we're going to be talking about this week, Bob, is the cultivation of empathy for effective therapy. A brilliant topic. Yeah, well, uh, 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 yeah, brilliant topic in itself, so... When you think of that, what do you think of, Jackie, when you think of cultivating empathy as a prerequisite for, you know, effective psychotherapy? What do you think of? I mean, what's your thoughts? Empathy is a a good one. I think we need to be empathic, but we need to be mindful of burnout if we're too empathic, if that makes sense. If you're seeing 20 clients in a week and you're you're overly empathic with all of them, it's, it's really, you need to look after yourself in this process that's my initial thought okay so good it's a good thought to have <laughs> good. What, just to clarify it even more for me what do you mean by overly empathic um when we overly associate with our clients or or you know the the transference thing to me empathy can kind of be part of that or transference can be part of empathy whichever way you want to look at it oh so what you mean is i think what you're saying is is when we over identify with the yeah client. yeah i think i've said it before that the universe has this wonderful way of sending us clients that kind of mimic what we're going through in our own personal life sometime yeah, okay, so I certainly agree with you that if you exhaust yourself through over-identification, then that's not a good place to be. Yeah, and th- for me, there's always a-, a question around sympathy and empathy and what's the difference and knowing what that difference is, sort of being alongside somebody in their journey. Well, let me and- answer that question. Yeah. Or at least my response to that question between the sympathy and empathy. I think sympathy come. I'm going to use transaction analysis to give my responses. Hopefully all the listeners will at least know the PAC model. Yeah. Um, for my response. Um, sympathy, I think, comes from the parent ego state. Okay. And, and often a quite might be even a suffocating, nurturing part of the parent ego state, but it's 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 often from a a parent place. Whereas empathy will come from the adult. Yeah, that's a good way of describing it. I've never heard it described that way before, Bob. So uh, I think there's a great difference. Yeah, because sympathy from the parent can often to the uh, you know the the client or the receiver feel quite plastic in other words might even feel unfortunately and though the person doesn't necessarily intend it that way may feel quite patronizing yeah yeah i can see that yeah and it comes from the parent part often often comes from the might even come from the compulsive rescuing part of the parent yeah and often feels, as I say, quite plastic or even patronising or may even feel not real Yeah. by the receiver. Whereas empathy, I think, comes from the adult state. Might borrow from some of the spontaneity of the child, but I think it's more from the adult ego state. It's an attempt to get into the skin of the other person. Yeah. So... Uh... If you're going into counselling or psychotherapy or anything like that, is is a person likely to be empathic anyway? No. Okay. Absolutely not. Oh, okay. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, in fact, I was thinking whether it's a certain type of person that does those sort of careers. Do you know what I mean? Well, anyway, it's never been asked me before. It's a really good question, by the way. And I, I said, I <laughs> interestingly, I said no very quickly. Um, and I still hold by that. Uh, and in the same ballpark, uh, people who, who are empathic and have that ability to be able to 
um, transport themselves, if you like, into the skin of the other person may be attracted to actually working in the helping professions. Um, yeah. So though I said no very quickly, uh, I, I think I'm I'm added that caveat actually. Um, but people who are empathic by nature may go into many careers where they're dealing with people. Yeah. Or, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily helping professions. I was, you know, I can think of many other professions where you deal with people. Um, and they may go somewhere else altogether. Yeah. Well, I don't think it necessarily follows, but I understand the question, I think, on further reflection, that if people are particularly good at empathy, they may be attracted more, perhaps, to helping professions. So how yeah. do we cultivate it then? If we haven't got it, which I presume we all have the ability to be empathic, although do we? Now I've said that out loud, I'm not sure we do. <laughs> well, it's a discussion we're having on the podcast and they're all interesting questions you're, you're, you're asking, really. I think they're important ones. Yes, I, I, I can only go with my belief systems here. I think we all have the potential to express empathy. So I, I just certainly believe that. But I think what gets into the, you know, what um, gets into the, what stops it happening, really, is a person's history. Okay. So if they haven't had parents that have been particularly empathic to them, then they won't learn empathy particularly. Yeah. But they can have it's the not potential. Been modeled. Yeah. Yeah. But if it hasn't been modeled or they haven't received empathy, um, then empathy can get repressed or at its best isn't allowed to flourish. Yeah. So I think the the person's history has a particular part to play in the cultivating of empathy, if you like. Um, I think my daughter, who was born, you know, she, she's been brought up with two psychotherapists, for example. And she, I think, is empathic. And also, she, interestingly enough, is in a helping profession job. Yeah. Working with helping the youth and uh, mental problems, so health problems. And people, you know, her own part, partner might say she's too empathic, and that's a whole other story. But I think she's had two therapists who model empathy, and she's been on the receiving end of empathy. Yeah. So I think a person's history has a lot to do with the cultivating of the ability of empathy. Yeah. So how how does empathy show up in the therapy room or how 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 do we use it in the therapy room? Well, I think there's different types of empathy as well. Before I go on to okay. saying that, yeah. So you know, I think I think there's also learned empathy. So I think people, uh, think, I'm thinking of some particular people in helping professions who I, I'm not sure are naturally empathic. I think they've, they've learned empathy from either the, the therapy journey they've been on, um, helping organisations they've past been in, um, reading what, they think should be the social response responses and they they i experience them coming from a, a learned empathy position now so that's not necessarily destructive but i think there's a difference between what i would call natural empathy which has been allowed to flourish from a very young age uh, and they've received empathy and all the things i've just talked about and people who have learned empathy so People that come, I'll give you another example of this. So people who are attracted for whatever reason to want to be psychotherapists and come to our training courses, you know, they have to be doing their own therapy for at least four years. Yeah. And the, their natural empathy, say, does it, I, I, I don't experience it particularly, um, say, at interview stage. Um, and I'm not even sure that they've been allowed to express empathy, but anyway. Uh, but, but after four years of therapy, you might find that 
you know, they, they have a learned empathy because their therapist has modeled empathy. They've learned how to respond and they've learned um, that that's the way forward in terms of social discourse and healthy relationships. Yeah. So I think people can learn empathy. Yeah. If that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, it's, definitely. Yeah, even if it's not being part of the upbringing <laughs> or or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's important to think about because when people train to be psychotherapists, I, I, I believe, and certainly in the training of psychotherapists at our institute, anyway, empathy is such an important quality to have in terms of um, communicating with the child ego state, particularly. Yeah. But also, aid of communication with the other person, i.e., the client in this case, um, so the client feels accounted for. There's a sense of attunement, and there's a sense of uh, a person come from the other person's frame of reference. Uh, the the that um, clients often learn empathy, not only for themselves, as I said, but also as a way forward in the therapy process. Yeah. Yeah, because that connection and that <clears throat> it's kind of an understanding that the other person gets you somehow with empathy. Mm. It kind of mm. it validates that they understand you somehow. Yeah. Well, I think it's somehow it's actually can be explained. I think it's the uh the therapist in this case we're talking about is actually able to get into this, get alongside the skin of the other person. Yeah. And some uh, models might say um, the person has the same terms of reference as the other person. But I think empathy is more than that. <clears throat> I think it's actually being attuned, uh, being able to as I say, get into the psychic skin of the other person. And it aims, it aids building up a relationship. Yeah, aids, definitely. Yeah. It aids um, complementary transactions. It aids um, the other person feeling accounted for. So it's a very good, if you want to use the word tool, you, call it, you can do. Yeah. Uh, in the aid of helping, of building up a, a positive relationship. And be able to come across, being able to come alongside the ch younger self or the child ego state of the other person. Yeah. So, in therapy training, particularly, there's a huge emphasis in cultivating empathy for those reasons. Yeah. So, in your training, um, did you have to do a hundred hour placement? Yeah. You did a voluntary placement, didn't you? No, no, not a voluntary placement. I we were I worked in the low cost clinic yeah, at the institute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's so, what I did. Yeah. Yeah, and able to do that, you had to uh, have a clinical endorsement to practice, and in your training, um, gone into triads to, to deliver clinical competencies. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And one of those competencies is that the the, the, the student can use empathy. So there's an emphasis on cultivating empathy yeah. in helping the working relationship with the client be more robust and positive. And when they go to supervision, when a person goes to supervision with their clients, for example, um, there is also the same process in terms of looking at using empathy as a way of actually coming alongside the child ego state or the younger self. Yeah. So empathy is cultivated in psychotherapy training. Yeah. I'm just looking back onto my <clears throat> training and I think it probably weaved its way through, but I'm not sure we ever did like a weekend on empathy or anything. It was kind of just in amongst it all. Yeah, but yes, and... It would have been a weekend on working with the child ego state. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, in that weekend, you are correct. What if one of the weaving 
through bits would have been how to use empathy. Yeah. Now, it also would have been weaved through other things like comp the competencies, yeah. like how to build up working relationships. So you are correct. Um, the, the cult of granting of empathy would have been central probably throughout the different training years. Yeah. Um, and especially, I think, in working with the younger self or the child ego state. Yeah. Or helping the person develop um, a healthy, you know, inner child, if you like, or working within a child. Yeah. Because the other person's younger self needs to feel that the therapist understands them. Yeah. Or at yeah. least, you know, has a, you know, motivation to do that. <clears throat> Which that the attunement and the connection and everything, I think is is vitally important for the therapy process. It has, to, yeah, yeah. And if that's not there, therapy becomes much harder. Yeah, and like you you mentioned earlier on about you know it it's sometimes feeling inauthentic or a bit plastic if it's if it's not genuine empathy, you know, that that's going to make the relationship, the therapeutic relationship, a lot more difficult. Mm. Yeah. There's a book by Richard Erskine, who was one of my mentors, called Beyond Empathy. It's a bit of an expensive book, so it's up to the listeners to uh, reflect on that. However, in that book, he takes clinical cases and talks about how empathy is used to, in the aid of effective psychotherapy and where that leads to. And it's a very interesting book. Yeah. And, um, there are many books, I'm sure, on empathy, but I like that one. And that's Richard Erskine. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I have got it here somewhere around in my, I'm looking at it now. Wow. So, I mean, if you're, if you're on my YouTube channel, there it is. But for people not on my YouTube channel, it's a lovely big brown book uh, with a keyhole on the front of it. And it says Beyond Empathy. And it's full of clinical cases where the author describes his use of empathy and other um, methods. See, I quite like a book that does that, that uses clinical cases or, you know, real life. Oh, oh. Yeah, situations that's, yeah that's yeah that's true it's yeah. one of the most popular books he's written and it's very interesting because it does exactly what you just says looks at clinical cases and sees how empathy is used yeah among other things yeah yeah because you can't fake it can you no you see i think the faking it often may be received as sympathy Yes, yeah. And once you get into the world of sympathy, the receiver often feels is parent driven. And once they get into that process, then they may feel that they're not actually seen and seen or accounted for from you know a different place. Yeah. Or they may feel suffocated or by what they may perceive as parental-led sympathy rather than adult inquiry. Yeah, because somebody once said something to me and it kind of stuck with me <clears throat> years and years and years ago, even before probably I started my training, that, you know, if somebody's been through something and they're having feelings and, you know, the, the counsellor or the therapist tries to take those feelings away from the client it's kind of disempowering to them. That's right. It's not up to us to take on board the suffering, if you want to call it that. No, it's much more healthy to witness the process. Yeah. Or be with them. Yes, yeah. Somehow rob them. Which of... I kind of see that as being empathic, is to be alongside them while they're, you know, experiencing whatever it is that they're experiencing, but not trying to take it on board or take it away from them, because mm. it's not ours to do that. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely correct. And um, 
an important point you've made there. It really is important. So that's kind of how I see I would use empathy in in the therapy room personally is to yeah. Yeah, and it's it's such an important point because a lot of therapists and and I don't want to discount the listeners here, but they may not understand what to do with feelings of the client. Yeah. So then they sort of panic and may go cognitively or they may move to a sympathy sympathy position or they may actually um, do many other things but not allow the person to feel their feelings and yeah. be on the, and for them to be on the journey with them it's usually a therapy issue yeah and again an experience issue as well i think in the early days i was probably frightened of excessive emotions by the clients <laughs> um yeah but and uh yeah maybe there's an experience issue and i think it's also to do with the person's history yeah maybe maybe yeah oh. It's both, isn't it? Yeah. So we need to learn, I think, as therapists, usually we start off in the training. If it's a relationally integrative training or a humanistic training, there will be an emphasis on, you know, how to use empathy in some way. Yeah. And how to cultivate that process. Because without that tool, if you like, therapy is much harder. Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 there's just something at the back of my mind about, you know, different personality types and that there are certain people like, I don't know, people with on the autistic spectrum and things like that, that aren't very good at reading social skills and that would have difficulty being empathic. Oh, absolutely. But it doesn't mean I agree completely with you. And that's that's very true. With people, uh, yeah, on the Asperger's style, or people who perhaps uh, have ADHD or th see things in black and white, um, may struggle it, to be empathic. Yeah, because they're not wired that way. Or uh, yeah, so I understand that completely, and it doesn't mean that the therapist can't. Be empathic even if it's only cognitive even if it's only cognitive empathy yeah so it might need to be modeled differently with different clients dependent on whereabouts yeah. they are yeah. yeah yeah so somebody who's histrionic for example who sees the world through feelings then the empathy is going to be at a feeling level isn't it yeah yeah somebody who's obsessive compulsive where it's all about thinking it may you may be at a empathic cognitive level yeah somebody like we just talked about who struggles with empathy or sees things in black and white type then it's going to be a different type of empathic empathic approach yeah it's not all about feelings no it's about empathy is about helping empathy is much more like i said at the beginning getting into the psychological skin of the other person so the other person feels understood by them yeah now that may demand different types of empathy and will do it. Actually, it will do, not, not might do. Yeah. And I suppose in a, in a session, the attunement and the pacing and you, 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 you learn to judge whether you are in the same place as what the client is, yeah. as in, yeah the the general feeling and the communication and the connection during that session you you kind of pick up on whether you're matching them yeah you do and, and clients will tell you actually so i mean even if we took even if we went into costas or we're talking to your friends or outside the therapy room uh people will know when another person is not apathic yeah they'll feel a disconnect yeah or they'll feel that the person doesn't understand them. And it's exactly the same in the therapy room. Yeah. And then they will do something. They'll they'll do things like they'll either tell the person, or oh, you do, you don't actually understand me. For yeah. You're not listening to me, or no, you're not getting me. me. Yeah. You're interrupting me, 
all those sorts of things. In fact, that happened to me the other day, and I think I'm particularly empathic, but I was in an assessment and, you know, there was no doubt that I was moving away from an empathic place. And she said, don't interrupt me. And so, yeah. you know, um, it was somebody who come from an assessment. And, and rightly so, by the way, because I wasn't, I wasn't being empathic at all. I was coming from a place of, um, I'm not quite sure, of wanting to hurry the assessment on, I think. And I asked lots of yeah. ridiculous, silly questions. Um, so empathy does come with pacing, you're correct. It does come with attunement. But delivered, delivered accurately, then that is a you know wonderful template for effective therapy. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting that you say, do you know what I mean? Even outside the therapy room, you kind of know with your friends or family or or work colleagues yeah. or whatever yeah. whether they're they're empathic or you yeah. know yeah definitely. You've got it's no. A good, it's a good experiment to do. To, <laughs> one of the things that I've learned over time is to to listen to my feelings and yeah. trust my instincts yeah. and my gut. If it doesn't feel right, then it probably isn't right. <laughs> you're absolutely correct and I, I think it's a very very good point that and also going back to the earlier point which is let's say a little bit more about when you were talking about different types now if somebody's highly narcissistic yeah i was thinking about the antisocial personality yeah, disorder they'll struggle bit, yeah. With empathy yeah yeah uh, because they aren't able to leave their ego outside the room yeah so the therapist that's highly narcissistic and hasn't done that therapy will struggle with empathy because they'll still be caught up with their own ego. Yeah. Yeah. And that that is quite a, a big thing for me. And having, you know, if you've got a client that's antisocial, and again, it's a feeling that you get that they're not they're not on the same level. They're not getting it. Now, do you mean the client's not getting it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if clients aren't getting it, what well, I think you you said not on the same level, then I think the therapist needs to step, take a step back. Yeah, trying to find a way to understand where the person's coming from. Yeah, and to make the connection a different way, maybe. And to make the connection a different way, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, because it can be. I suppose, you know, scary and overwhelming to some clients to have that connection of feelings if they're not used to it and to have somebody that is empathic and showing empathy to them if they're not used to receiving it, it can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes. So maybe we do need to scale it back at times. And might be very scary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you're absolutely correct. So that's a clinical concern to you know to be taken to account yeah um, and i think cultivating empathy least can lead to a template for effective therapy yeah yeah because i i've been in a situation as a, a client in a therapy room you know when i was doing my training where the therapist was very probably very empathic but very nurturing as well. And because I wasn't used to that in my upbringing, I had a reaction to it because it was just too full on for me. Oh. Oh. You know, li literally the hers were standing up on the back yeah. of the neck type so, of reaction. Uh, that's yeah. right. So if the therapist was truly empathic, they would, and was attuned to you, they would realise that was happening. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's a skill that, you know, that that being in a tune with and noticing a shift or a change, you know, yeah, yeah. E even subtle things like a therapist cocking the head to one side and dropping the voice to me, I reacted to it. So it's, yeah. it's about being mindful of all of these sort of things as well. Yeah, and I think with true empathy comes attunement. Mm. Yeah. I'd and like to makes, think so. Yeah, and that makes therapy a lot more effective. Because when we are attuned or we're picking up on the subtleties of the relationship and the connection and the communication, it does make therapy 
a whole lot easier. It's absolutely true. So if yeah. you can cultivate that to, that tool, that technique, that part of yourself, then that's a wonderful, you know, um, place to go to as a psychotherapist. Yeah. Now, you are correct about over empathy, if you like, where the therapist um, can go to, but I actually think it's more when there's positive, there's, uh, how can I explain this? Per personal identification of the therapeutic issue, which leads to the therapist being exhausted. Yeah. yeah. Over, it's an interesting one. Is that over empathy? Is that a therapist being an over, over empath? Um, you can look at it that way. Sure, you can look at it that way. Yeah. Because I think, you know, maybe it's a topic for a, another podcast or whatever, but, you know, it's like compassion fatigue. And when we're too compassionate and empathic and feeling a lot of feelings, and it, you know, it, it's, it burns us out. Yeah, so we need to be aware of all those things you're talking about. Yeah. At the same time, um, I think that empathy is so important. Mm. And I think the client will feel understood. Yeah. And the relationship will be more effective you know, in, the, in the process we're talking about. Yeah. Definitely. I agree. Thank you for that, Bob. Another Thank wonderful you. podcast. No, I enjoyed talking about that. And it's of course I don't I think I probably had natural empathy, but it was repressed. Um, or I repressed that part of myself because of the high critical parent that I had in my head. Now as I did more therapy and learned to have an observing self that was more compassionate with myself. I allowed that part of myself to flourish more. So I, so I think my ability to empathize, okay, I learned through training, but I became more natural in it, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. I think once I descaled down the um, attacking parent in my head, so the spontaneity, genuineness, freedom of expression was more evident. Yeah. That's that's quite a powerful thing to say, Bob. Do you know what I mean? That yeah, you you were suppressing it, and once that was taken away, and you were allowed to be, well, you felt more able to be that. Because I suppose we can feel quite vulnerable in that situation as well by showing our own emotions and connections to what's going on in the therapy room. It's not always a a comfortable thing to do. It it often isn't, and if you have a critical parent in your head it's even more uncomfortable yeah yeah so if we can start to replace that replace that with a a nurturing narrative or an observing compassionate self then i think empathy will flourish yeah yeah because i think in the beginning and the early stages of, of being a, a, a therapist i thought i couldn't show my emotions in the therapy room Mm. Mm. whereas you know it's now sometimes i have no option because they just pop up <laughs> yeah, yeah. and i'm okay saying to them i feel really emotional when i hear you saying that or i see mm. the way that that's affected you or whatever it is i'm okay them knowing that it's actually impacted me yeah and those are empathic transactions yeah but it 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 didn't feel comfortable at the beginning, I thought I couldn't show any emotion because I was a professional. And whereas actually that breaks down an awful lot of barriers in the therapy room now, I think. Yeah, and, and it's great to hear the use of empathic transactions because, you know, the clients often have lived in a, a barren world mm. of criticism rather than empathy. Yeah. So to have their therapist um use empathic transactions in the service of the client or the service of themselves is a marvelous uh, 
permission to be different, I think. Good. I'm glad it's okay, Bob, because I do it quite regularly. Uh, I, think it's more than okay. I think it's more than okay. It's like if you're working that empathic way with empathic trans transactions in the service of helping release the client and model the therapist, sorry, the client to be different, it's more than okay. It's what I think effective therapy is. Mm. Yeah. See, see, this is one of the reasons why I love this podcast, Bob, and I hope that the listeners get something from it. Because as a therapist, we we don't know what happens in other therapy rooms. We don't get the, yeah. the option to, you know, see inside how somebody else does therapy, if that makes sense. Oh, perfect. And fortunately, I move in the world of meeting a lot of therapists, uh, through supervision and other places where I think what wonderful therapy they've been doing it. And then sometimes I hear uh, examples and I think, good gosh, is that really happening that way? Um, I hear more examples of positive psychotherapy, but you are absolutely right. Um, supervision, by the way, especially tape supervision. Yeah, yeah. Is where we can share with our supervisor and the supervisor can hear in the inner world of the, the the process and can give you know can talk about it that way and also you are correct we often accept through training and supervision all the things we're just talking about here um don't know what really happens in the therapy room yeah because I know how I, I do therapy, but I'm not sure how other people do therapy. It's like, I know, you know, where I trained, we were all trained the same way. So I'd like to think that, you know, the basic, the core values are the same. But how we implement that, we always add our own personality on it. Yes. So we're, we're all going to be slightly different anyway. But, you know, I'm quite open in sharing how I oh. am in the therapy room. But there's always that part of me, especially in these podcasts, Bob, that I'm getting it right because you're, like I said, you're my mentor and you're my guru. So well, I'm always a bit dubious. <laughs> the way you've just talked about empathic transactions, I think that's a really wonderful way to do therapy. Oh, thank you. So, and I like the way you started the podcast when you talked about the difference between sympathy and empathy. And I do think you do think, and you didn't say this, but I do think many people think they're being empathic when they're being sympathetic when actually they're coming from a different part of themselves and uh the receiver might see it as sympathy yeah it's more parent driven yeah so I'm, I'm glad you gave the the opportunity to say what i think is the difference because i think i'll repeat it again i think that some therapists might think that being empathic but actually they're coming from a completely different part of themselves and the clients often feel it's sympathy and that, 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 that they feel missed. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a shame because we don't want our clients to feel missed or not seen. No, and I, I often the therapist doesn't want that either, but they I don't actually know the difference between empathy and sympathy. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Yes. Love it. Great. Thank you. So what we're going to be doing in the next episode, Bob, is something that you touched on a couple of sessions ago, and oh, I was just that? intrigued by it. Is, is therapy a middle-class profession? Oh, yes, I'm laughing to myself because I did, and I have such a lot to say on that subject. So I look forward to the next podcast. Me too. It's going to be a good one. Until <laughs> next time, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to The Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.